looks like we're live. You may begin. Okay, thanks. So hi everyone, welcome back. Um, so we're gonna talk about the Habitat um, application. Kathy is with us, she's traveling, so she's here on the phone. Um, and so earlier today, I did send out uh, just a quick little overview of the Mountain Brook project. So I didn't know if anyone had any questions or if you just wanted to jump into your, your thoughts about the, the application and the presentation that we heard last week. Diane. Good evening, hi. Um, thank you, Molly, for putting the um, PDF together and sending that out. Um, on the pie chart, the funding sources as percent of development costs, that's, in, that's Habitat's funding sources, correct? Correct. Yes, that, exactly. That is just for Habitat's project. Right. So then um, some of the categories we're still waiting, like while well, the Colorado Division of Housing that is a piece that um, hasn't been awarded yet, correct? So according to Habitat, um, they've been awarded 15,000 of it. And the way that it works is that the state provides that money to the state Habitat, who then uh, provides it to the affiliates. So they've been awarded 15,000 they believe they will get the rest of the money or be awarded for the rest of it in September from, from the state habitat. So the money is there from the state of Colorado. Um, but however that funding cycle works, they'll so hear back in September. And the reason I was asking is I was looking at the original application and comparing, so, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm finished for now. Okay. <laughs> Jeff? Sorry, was that 15 of the 62 total? Yes. That's not 15 per unit, right? Correct. 15,000 of the total 62,000 that they've put in from the state. Another quick question on these funds. Are these um, typically grants or can we structure them as a loan? I can't recall. So I believe they can be, a, they are, it can be a grant. I suppose, Kathy, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think they could also be a loan if we wanted them to be. I think that's true. So usually, I mean, usually, the city of Boulder usually grants their home funds. Um, I know we have done it both ways. We've loaned it sometimes, um, particularly if they were serving the upper, upper affordable um, AMIs, um, but we've also granted it as well. I guess having it as a loan in this case with for sale product might be kind of difficult potentially, right? Or I guess a, a piece of it might get paid off at each sale if we structured it that way, potentially. Just thinking out loud there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how, what it would do to their, if, 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 if the loan was paid back with each sale, how that would affect their pro forma because what they are doing is is selling those mortgages as soon as they sell a home to an affordable buyer to be able to use that money to quickly move into continuing the construction so if a chunk of that was coming back i don't know how that would affect those sales proceeds moving forward and continuing with the construction Yeah, that might be difficult. Are there any other questions or 
thoughts on the on the project and the request? Do you have an idea of which way you may be leaning? Well, I have um, a question, but I'll wait. Go ahead. Just like the conversation that was going on the other, like last week, the, the question that Kathy asked and, and Lori followed up on is just because I don't, you know, I don't live and breathe all these acronyms, but basically kind of in relationship to the inclusionary, I'm just trying to encapsulate it in a, in a sentence or two so that I understand, because I feel like that might still be kind of an outstanding issue is, let me, let me say well, kind of what I understood was you're already getting the fee waivers. Um, the land is being donated by the, by the developer is my, is my recollection but that the pieces that are coming from the city of Longmont would be the 200 and what was their, their ask to 40, 270, something like that. Plus the, um, the fee waivers, which I think we're all in is about 350. And I think the, the, and their, and their whole, their kind of their, their, their ratio of the number of units that they're doing in relationship to the inclusionary requirement is below the threshold. Is that, and so there's kind of some, some tension between that or potentially some tension. I'm trying to understand what council, council's thinking on that was. Yeah, so their request is 120,000. 120, got the numbers turned around. And then um, the fee waivers, which would be separate, which are right. available to any developer, are, they are estimating about 93,000. Yeah, 93 is my reflection. And so habitats, is doing eight units, but it's the, the master developer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who actually got the lower requirement. So they're the ones who came to council and made the proposal um, to provide land donation that would be below right. the minimum uh, requirement or the minimum that's in the, the ordinance. Right. Um, so council basically gave them a, a pass on that. Yes, so they, they allowed them to have to provide a total of 8% is what their inclusionary housing requirement is um, to be fulfilled by Habitat and the Veterans Community oh, right. Project. So, so then kind of fill me in. So that's a great reminder. So then fill me in on the piece that um, the, what Kathy was talking about is it, or, or the, the point that she brought up um, which then Lori kind of um, responded to by email to the group. So essentially the master developer got a lower inclusionary housing requirement, mm -hmm. but the affordable, but they are not actually providing the affordability. The affordability yeah. is being provided by Habitat. Yeah. But because the developer got a lower requirement, now mm -hmm. the city will have to provide or potentially will provide additional funding to meet that lower affordability. Oh, that right. Okay. Got it. Developer was allowed to get. Right. And if, and if the developer were actually doing that, took on the, the building and the construction of those affordable units, presumably they would have been able to capitalize at least most of it. Yes, Correct. and they and they probably would only be would be doing the units at eighty percent, right? Right. Of the, the lower sixty percent that habitat. Okay. Okay. Jeff. Oh. I just want to clarify something real quick. Um, going back to the tables that you sent out earlier today. Um, cause you just, you just mentioned that they're at 60%, but truly looking at this table here of, um, sales prices where they're going to be at, it looks like they're 20 to 30 and in the four bedroom case, almost 40% lower than 60 AMI, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, in my mind, a pretty compelling reason to look at the additional 15,000 a unit. And I, 
think David alluded to that a little bit in the meeting when Kathy asked, um, you know, why, why should we be looking at this request? And I, I think he made a good point there that truly we're going to be or habitat. I don't, I don't know exactly what those numbers are, but it looks like they're going to be 50 or below. Yeah. Do you happen to know what those exact numbers are? Yeah, so the 60% and 80% are the, the prices that the city sets and habitat generally, even if they are at 60%. Um, the, it all depends on how you do your formulas um, are lower than, than the cities. So um, just a second, let me look at that up. Molly, did you want me to display that chart? Um, no, that's okay. I will just, so these are slightly old figures. We are also currently looking at the formula that we use to set the affordable prices um, to potentially change that, um, those figures. So, sorry. Okay, so the city's 60% prices, the two bedroom is 237,600. Three bedroom is at 263,800. And the four bedroom is currently 306,600. So again, we're probably gonna change those or potentially we'll change those, but those would be the current the current maximums right now. And then habitats, there are two bedrooms were 200,000, three bedroom was 215,000, and there are four bedrooms, uh, 225. I guess Diane. one last point. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, Diane. One last point I was going to make there in, in relation to all this in the additional grant, if you will, um, you know, to put the other 15,000 into it per unit and to see those reduction in the cost for the in family. I like that because I think um, it's not necessarily if we're giving them the other 120,000, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know, they're putting less into it. I, I see it as that's going straight to the families in, in each of those units. So uh, unless I'm looking at that incorrectly, let me know. But, you know, to get a reduction from 306 to 225 on that four bedroom for 15,000, um, I think it's a great thing for the, the end user, the end family there. Mm. So just a comment. Thank you. Diane. Well, thank you, Jeff. That's the direction that I was going in. <laughs> you actually put some uh, solid numbers behind it. I was just working on it. But um, so I, I was looking to at the original application from Habitat and um, on page six, there is the um, <clears throat> Uh, area that you fill in in regards to housing units, resident selection, and it does list 30 to 60 percent of um, AMI for the four two bedroom, two three bedroom, two four bedroom. And um, so, it, what would you say is from the, the amount? Then I haven't gotten that far with my math. 
is the percentage going to be? It's less than 60, it's more than 30. In terms of the household that they actually serve? No, no, of what they're going to be uh, putting the percentage of AMI that's going to be offered for the home ownership of the Habitat homes. In their application, they're saying it'll be 30 to 60% um, on the, the uh, PDF sent out today. We see that 60% is quite a bit higher and Habitat is lower. I, was, I haven't gotten to the, what, what are we looking at for what they're so, hoping? So if you're comparing Habitat's prices to the 60% set by the city? Yeah, basically. So habitat would be around, let's see. So there, there would be between 50 and 60. We, we just break them down by 10% increments, so I don't know. The like 47, I got. But. Yeah, well, yeah, so our 50% prices are at 179. Okay. 60 is at 224. Um, So they sound like they're about 55 or so. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. Right around in there. Um, the thing with Habitat, sorry, this is Kathy, and I didn't mean to interrupt, but, um, and I didn't wave my hand because you can't see it. <laughs> um, the thing with Habitat, so that they set their prices at a certain price point, um, and they, can, um, they would be allowed to serve up to 60% AMI income people or families, um, but if they got a 40% AMI family that they income qualified, they would just adjust the, um, the payment that the household actually made so that it fit within whatever they said, 27% of their total income because they do their mortgages themselves. They have a, the ability to flex the, the um, term of the loan um, out to make it affordable um, for the whatever homeowner they, they get into the homes, uh, which is, you know, that's a really neat thing and a good thing. Um, and it doesn't fit as neatly into um, our program as, as some others that are, are, you know, more strict around the 80% income and 80% sales price, so. Are there any more thoughts or questions? Diane? Well, so following up on a comment that um, we discovered tonight, and that is if um, there's the potential of lo re-looking at the formula for the 60%, um, 80% AMI City of Longmont standards, um, I'm wondering if there's a need for a consideration of a more dynamic um, application process too. Um, you know, the question that started this, and it was it was great to have that, is are we are we requiring too much from the developers to move this process through, and and yet. It, in this day and age, it seems like the more creative a developer can be <clears throat> to make affordable housing home ownership, especially, be available is uh, necessary. So, um, just like we were saying earlier, too, to get to reflect each developer's <laughs> um, way of navigating. Um, 
with a one size fits all application may be a real challenge. And we'll have conversations like this again. Yes, probably will have more conversations <laughs> like this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, this is Kathy again. I, you know, council definitely designed the inclusionary housing program to try and be as creative as, as possible um, while keeping to certain standards. Um, but developers can come in and they can um, request exemptions. Um, they can request um, combinations of how they're gonna provide the housing um, and council will consider that. Um, under the voluntary alternative agreement. So a developer has to put together a proposal and bring it to council. It's vetted by staff as well, um, including uh, our city attorneys in order to make sure it still complies with the code. Um, but it is the paragraph that we sometimes call let's make a deal because <laughs> they do get quite creative sometimes in, in what they, they propose. Um, but you know, that was, somewhat on purpose um, that council wanted to see what they might come up with that might be more creative than just following a, a very structured and rigid um, inclusionary housing program. Um, and as a result on the back end, then we have to write really creative uh, agreements around <laughs> how they're going to provide the housing and to ensure that it actually gets built and they're not just passing on their requirement to a habitat or to a housing authority or to somebody like that and then walking away and really not doing anything more than um, donating land and off-site infrastructure. Um, so, um, and, and then in, in considering things like this, like I said, this is one of the first ones that's come in that's not a 100% affordable project under inclusionary housing. So we've had a couple of those um, in the past and to me that's less of a it's the actual developer that's doing the housing and doing it at a hundred percent which is way over the 12 percent so um, it makes more sense to me to to consider it in this process um, for additional city subsidies so it really I, my call was just to start thinking about that and trying to ensure that we're being fair to every um, everybody and that that a developer isn't taking advantage um, of the opportunity to be creative um, and offloading is not the right word, but um, transferring their requirement onto a nonprofit who, you know, doesn't have the wherewithal or the resources that a lot of developers have. So it was just really trying to think it through and be cautious about that. Um, I have nothing against Habitat at all, um, and I think it makes a lot of sense if they are getting to lower incomes than the um, 60 percent, that that might make all kinds of sense to, to further fund them other than just what would normally be required. Quick question, and I, I think I ask this every time, but um, what do we have available this year and looking at next year as well? What is available? I was going to ask the same question, which I ask every meeting. Kathy, do you have that easily available? I do. I just looked at it the other day. So we have $800,800 in affordable housing funds. For the rest of the year, um, Habitat with this application. Kathy, you're you're breaking up. We can't. They did not request home Chodo funds. Um, the Chodo fund. Can you? Is this better? Oh. At all? Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, so the Chodo funding comes to us from through the consortium and um, it is a little bit more, sometimes more flexible and more available 
um, other than just in the year that we get our allocation. So um, like I, I indicated before, we got our allocation was coming to us in 2021. We allocated it all to the Kaufman project. There is a set aside of Chodo funds in 2021, so that is available. And it's around, I think they estimated 150 to 160,000. They also still have Chodo funding available from 2021. Um, they're in the position the city of Boulder is in that their Chodo has a project, but the timing um, keeps getting pushed off. So there's an ability if we decide we do want to fund this that we could get either all or partial funding from 2020 and then um, if it's partial, then the rest of it um, from the 2021 funds. So um, we're trying to be flexible consortium wide with the Chodo funding. Um, and then CDBG funds aren't gonna be available until fall um, to winter when we do an, uh, the third or fourth quarter application round. And those won't be available until 2021. Who were who who the um, organizations that were getting the Chodo funds that no longer are in Longmont? I think the Longmont Housing Authority at one point had been a Chodo. Um, I don't know of any others. Yeah, it was the, actually the Housing Development Corporation, um, the, the nonprofit arm of the housing authority was at one time and they are no longer and FISO was at one time um, I don't we never gave them any Chodo funding um, for a project in Longmont but it, I don't know if they still are or not yeah well, I've heard thank you for encouraging Habitat to do so to bring in more federal dollars into Longmont that way Um, I have a comment to make uh, if we're hoping that Lori, Lori will join on I can make a comment um, and that is I, I and I wanted to say something last week with um, Dave and John from Habitat on but I didn't want to take up time and that is I was so impressed with their reasonable accommodations policy statement that they drafted and how inclusive it is and my intent, if it's okay, would be to share with my executive director and, and, and write a letter of commendation. And I could run it through TRG to them or, or whatever. But um, for, so I, I pulled it up here, for um, not only um, to accommodate a variety of needs is their statement, but you know, they included allergies and cognitive impairments and uh, visual and auditory. Um, so very, very comprehensive. Um, so if that's okay, I'd like to, to, to do an, a comment or a, a recognition of that comprehensive accommodations policy. Kathy, do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, I think if you want to um, suggest that the TRG can consider it whether to do it or not or if you wanted to do it as CPDW, CPWD organization I think that would be perfectly acceptable. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly fine doing it as CPWD since it's always on our radar um, and I can share I can CC it with TRG. I think that would be fine unless the other um, TRG members are feel really strongly that they would like to to support that. What do, what do you guys think? I'm good with it. So that's agreeing to have it go from the TRG. 
Is that what, is that what yeah. we're nodding about? Okay. <laughs> I, I will draft something and share it with Molly. Thank okay. you. So Lori did say to just start with her, she wasn't sure if or when she would be able to um, join in. So I don't know if, if people have, have, are ready to make a decision, we can, we can move that way um, since I don't know if or when <laughs> she may be coming on. I'm ready. Okay. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Well, we can just start with Diane and go down my row. <laughs> what are your, what's your recommendation, Diane? Um, I would like to, um, well, we should start with Jeff. He's the one that always puts it in good words there. Okay. Um, some dollars and money. <laughs> Is that okay, Jeff? Yeah, actually, I'd make it fairly simple. I would, um, in this case, I would recommend that we fund the 120000 as a grant to the project. Okay, thank you. And I do want to give full disclosure, as uh, has been the case in the past. I have been talking with Dave about being the lender on this project, um, although I, I was not aware that they were going to make this application prior to us actually giving terms on it. And, um, and we don't have a commitment either at this point. So we're one of uh, a few partners that Habitat has in the banking side. Um, so again, we're not under a commitment and um, I certainly have my TRG hat on right now and not my banker hat, so. Thank you. I vote in support of the 120000 as a grant. Okay. Michelle? I support the 120000 as a grant. Jake, do you have anything you would like to add or say? Well, I think the group came up with uh, a good call here. The project works for me and I I think that's a recommendation that HHSAB will largely agree with. I think there'll be some questions about what was asked at the end of the last meeting regarding some of the conversations we've had here. So maybe an explanation for, for them that I can carry back. But I've got my notes and I think it's a good explanation. So I, I'm I'm in support for sure. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think that that is it. Uh, Kathy, do you have anything you want to add? Um, just that we'll get with the city of Boulder on um, what year the funds would come from and figure all that out before we take it to the housing advisory board. So that would be the only possible change that we might make. It might be a split of 60,000 and 60,000, but it, to get to the full 120 at some point. Okay. Great. Um, well, thank you. Good question. Yeah. Sorry, before we head out, um, not to keep belaboring this point, but um, Kathy's question, you know, going forward, is that something that we're going to want to discuss further? Is that something city council will discuss or, or do we just take a, a case by case and our project by project approach and, and look at each one individually rather than trying to come up with some type of parameters there, just to, I, I don't know, um, something to ponder for the group. Yeah, this is Kathy. I'm, I'm of a couple of opinions, I guess. Um, I think council would appreciate if there was a philosophy or a thought process that we could articulate around this. Um, that we could present to them that they could react to they that seems to work better um, for them um, and um, it's not knowing what is going to be coming up i 
I mean, we could take a, um, a look in the pipeline and kind of project forward, um, I guess, for some inclusionary housing projects, what we might be receiving. So I am sure we'll probably get another request from Habitat for the sugar mill project, which they're um, also doing a, um, it's a more straight land donation um, type of a project to uh, meet the developers uh, requirements, but I think they're also doing it at 12% and not at a lower percentage. So 12% um, of the total homes will still be affordable. So um, maybe we can look at what's coming up and put together um, before we meet, uh, do another funding round, what we might be likely to see and then get the groups together um, and kind of talk through what we're what we're thinking about. Um, that might make the most sense at this point. I want to get you guys together anyway and just talk about the process and um, looking into the future. But um, you know, if TRG's um, working, if we're getting what we need from from both groups, I know the Housing Advisory Board has been feeling a little disconnected, which is why, again, why we did the presentations together. Um, so really trying to figure out how, how can we strengthen um, the review process and get you guys' input on that as well. So uh, maybe in, gosh, July is almost here. <laughs> maybe in August <laughs> uh, we could have something um, pulled together and, and have a meeting and have something for you guys to react to. That sounds good. Uh, and um, what, what would be, sorry, Kathy. Just curious, what the next round, uh, when the next round of applications would be due? Um, I will tell you just a quick second. So they, the applications are due July 27th and actually the TRG and advisory board joint meeting is scheduled for August 13th. So we might want to push that back a little bit, just given everything else we've got going on mm -hmm. um, an update may be due a September application or something like that. I just, yeah. yeah. I can take a look at that. Well, and I, I would appreciate um, some what if scenarios and um, also the, the differential between developing affordable rental units versus home ownership. And, um, and in, in regards to funding this project and habitat projects in general with home ownership, that would be a strong message that I would want shared as to why I'm in support of this. Um, and, and that it, I think the wheels were already put into motion with some of the uh, conversations already with city council, um, moving the, the needle down to 8%. Um, and, and, you know, is that because of home ownership? as well from from that initial level as well so it'd be a good conversation to have okay great anything else okay well thank you very much for your time and your all your input and um we will be back in touch. Thank you. Guys. Bye, all. Thank you all. Great as always. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.